Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to this special service this morning, whether you're in church, in the church halls, or online. Special welcome to the Reverend Andres Galice and his wife, Marianne, who's in the church here. He's preaching this morning as a candidate to fill the vacancy in our two congregations. Before he begins the service, Andres will give some background information on his life and career so far. After the service, please follow the instructions of the stewards. Those in the church will leave by the front door. Those in the halls will leave by the door at the top end of the main hall. Hand sanitizer and offering plates are at both exits. And please observe social distancing as you leave. Because of regulations, Andras will not be allowed to greet you afterwards. Then, please remember, tomorrow evening, Monday the 12th at 7.30, we will be having a congregational meeting in Hamilton Road Presbyterian Church in Bangor. Please remember a face mask and also bring a pen. On the way in, you will be asked to sanitise your hands and also be marked off the voters list so we know who is present. The church is on Hamilton Road in Bangor. If you turn down the side of the church, and the Prospect Road, just as you reach the back end of the church, turn right and there's a lane. This lane will take you to the back door of the church, which is where we will enter. Going down the lane a bit, there's a large car park where you're able to park. As you arrive, please wait to be escorted to a seat. And then next Sunday service at 11.30 will be conducted by the Reverend Alan Wilson. You still need to contact me during the week if you intend to be present next Sunday. Thank you. Over to you, on, boss. Thank you very much, Herbert. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be here with you today. Thank you so much for the invitation. And hi to those who are at the other side of the screen, too. My name is Andras Gilica. I'm from Hungary and we are calling Ireland our home for 10 years and a week now with my beautiful wife who is sitting there amongst you. Before my assistantship at Stormont Presbyterian Church, I worked in Kilkenny Presbyterian Church that's halfway between Dublin and Cork at the other side of the border. And I worked with their youth there for three years. This was about five, six sentences so I need your feedback. Would you please lift your hand up if you are able to understand uh, what I'm saying and if you, if you can follow my accent? Oh, great to see the hands. Thank you very much. OK, uh, let's check the other side. Should I talk any slower? No hands in the air this time. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I understand that you are going to be looking at me and listening to me. But really what today is about is that you and me together worshiping God. John chapter 17 verse 15 is going to help us to praise God. I love the way Jesus is interceding for us at the Father. He said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. I don't know how your past week has been. I don't know what's happened to you right before you came to church. But I know that our Savior Jesus prayed for you and for me. 
and I knew that the gentle Savior was the God the Father, not to exempt us from challenges or difficulties, but to protect us and shield us, to be our strength during the dark times. And I knew the one who is powerful enough to say a word and the whole universe jumps into existence is here today. He is our strong deliverer. Let us recognize and enjoy God's presence as we worship, worship him by quietly singing or opening praise. King of kings, majesty. And I'd like to ask everyone to remain seated uh, while we are singing. King of Kings, Majesty. King of Kings, Majesty, God of Heaven, living in me, gentle Savior, closest friend, strong believer. Come, let us use our privilege to approach God's throne and talk to our Creator. Let us pray. Father, if we would look to ourselves only, we would have no ground to come to you. But today we are praising you for your love, what you have been revealing to us in Christ. Thank you that because of Christ, we can approach you in freedom and confidence. Thank you that we are adopted. We are your children. We are redeemed, forgiven, and there is no condemnation standing against us. Thank you that since we are in Christ, we are citizens of heaven, and we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. You have dressed us in royal robes we don't deserve. And in return for your great love, we live to serve your majesty. Father, teach us to keep Jesus at the core of all we do. Help us to recognize you each and every day. We pray for those who never smile, never laugh, and never rejoice in you. For those who have lost the ability to relax and feel free. For those who rush through their lives with not a moment to spare. Open their eyes, Father, so they would be able to recognize you. We pray for those who are suffering from the consequences of the virus. Those who are alone, isolated from their loved ones those who are insecure at their workplace or gripped by anxiety and fear for their health. We pray for our NHS, for all the doctors, nurses, admin personnels and staff, 
Would you surround them with your saving grace? We pray for our politicians too. Inspire them with your wisdom and give them strength as they face challenges so they would, they would make the best decisions for us. We pray for the farmers, shop workers, all those who continue to supply what we need in the manufacturing, service, and hospitality industry. We pray for those who are finding hard to cope with the changed circumstances. Would you pour out your Holy Spirit and reveal your love, care, and majesty to them? And use us, Lord, too. Jesus, shine through us into the darkness. Would you highlight for us a person every day, Lord, whom you would like to reach through us with a smile, a kind word, a gift, some practical help, or with silently praying for them? Make us bold to share your healing word with those who are wounded. And would you come close to us and talk to us personally, as we read and study your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I would love to invite all the boys and girls up front to have a wee chat and to share a story. Uh, but unfortunately, we are not allowed to do that at this time. Uh, this is not going to be a children's address only, uh, but let's make it a family time so everyone is involved. We cannot get together with the boys and the girls but what we can do is to lift our hands so i'd like to ask everyone to lift your hand if you have a pet at home anyone's got a pet yeah there are a few hands in the air all right is it a dog bigger than a dog smaller than a dog all right so there are bigger and smaller and we have dogs as well that's great today's story is about peter he loved to visit his grandparents and his favorite was the hen. They had a special game. Peter marked at front and the hen followed him and Peter spent hours in the garden playing this game. One day when Peter arrived to visit his grandparents, he couldn't find the hen anywhere. He looked everywhere in the garden, but there was no sign of the hen anywhere. Finally, he found her at the hen house, the chicken coop at the corner, sitting there. So Peter wanted to game and, and went to the hen and, and called, called out to play. But the hen was not moving at all. Peter wanted to play. So he lifted her gently. And guess what's happened? There were some eggs. So Grandpa told Peter to leave the hen alone. And every time Peter visited, they were, they were not able to play this game, but, but Peter brought some food and some fresh water to the hen. And he checked the eggs as well. He was really curious about what's happening there. And one day, when he checked the eggs, he found small chicks under the wings. And the chicks joined the marching game quickly. So Peter was marching up front, the hen right behind him, and then all the, all the chicks, one by one. And Peter observed that whenever uh, a dog was barking loud or an eagle was flying above them, the hen spread its wings and all the chicks ran under the wings and they were safe and secure there. Something really strange happened one day when Peter finished at the crash and went to his grandparents. There were neighbors standing on the street. And he even saw a fire engine. His parents told him that the hen house caught fire. When it was safe, he ran to find his friends. And he found the hen completely black. Peter was crying because he loved the hen and he loved playing with them so much. Grandpa brought a shoebox to bury the hen 
And as grandpa lifted the body of the hand, guess what? All the small chicks were there, alive. There was enough air between the feathers, and it kept the chicks alive. They learned to hide under the wings, and that saved their life. This heartwarming story reveals us something about Jesus did for us. He died to save us. He died so we can live. But unlike the hen, Jesus rose again on the third day. Jesus is alive. We can run to him at any time when we are scared or when we are in danger, and we can, we can find comfort and peace under his wings. Jesus, John chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We are safe. We are safe with Jesus. Come, let's talk to him in prayer. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you gave your life to save us. You love us so much. It's amazing that you came to life again. You are alive. And you are here. Thank you that we can run to you anytime. We are safe with you. You are the best, Jesus. Amen. We came to our Bible reading. Before reading Psalm 57, I'd like to tell you a short story. My dad had been preparing to preach at a mission outreach about five years ago when he got a heart attack. He got into the hospital quickly and the doctors worked hard and they ran so many tests on him. God spared his life and he is keeping well. I've been amazed, that's the reason I'm telling you the story. I've been amazed by the methods that doctors can see what's happening inside someone's heart. Our heart has a physical function, and it's vital for us to stay alive. But the Bible describes another function of the heart, a spiritual function. Our heart is the center of our emotions, desires, and will. And the heart's spiritual role is also just as vital, vital as the, uh, for us to stay alive as the physical part. I'd like to invite you to do a few heart checkups with me today. Don't worry, it's not the medical one. We don't need a medical degree for that. So I'm going to read Psalm 57. If you have your own Bible, feel free to open it. I'm going to read from NIV version. Or if you have a Bible, feel free to pull it up and keep it open so you can follow uh, what I'm talking about. So let's do three heart checkups based on Psalm 57. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose thongs are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my paw. 
but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul. Awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. What's your best guess about David's mood when he wrote this psalm? If we read verse 7, My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Do you think he was at his happy place? Well, actually, David was hiding because King Saul wanted to kill him. So let's check the heart of King Saul first. The heart is the center of our emotions, desires, and will. God allowed his nation to anoint Saul as their first king of Israel. His reign started well, but as time passed by, though God kept revealing his will, Saul did not listen to God. Saul disobeyed the very person who had been giving him the power. King Saul had an ungrateful, disobedient heart. Unfortunately, this is a serious condition. In what ways is this disobedient heart is different to a healthy one? Well, a healthy heart is convinced that God loves me. So when he's revealing his will for me, his next steps for me, he will always give, give, give me the strength, the power and the peace I need to be able to walk with him and to obey him. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. A healthy heart would rejoice that my gentle Savior, my closest friend, wants to talk to me every day. He is warning me of, of, of traps so I wouldn't fall into them. He wants to encourage me so I can push through the dark and challenging times. He is lavishing his love on me so I wouldn't sacrifice my values by trying to please people. Yes, Jesus wants to rewrite my preconceptions too, but he is God. He sees things clearer than me, so I obey him. I follow him, I walk with him. This is how a healthy heart would think. But Saul's ill heart to God's guidance as an offense. And because of Saul's disobedient heart, God wanted David on the throne instead of Saul. But as you can imagine, Saul didn't want to resign at all. God's gifts for Saul, the power and authority became his idols. He loved much more the gifts of God than God the giver himself. And this is a bad news, because if not treated well, this condition of the heart is terminal. To put it in contrast, this is how a healthy heart would think. God loves me. He is constantly giving me good things. Some of these gifts are only temporary though, and when time comes, I need to let them go. And by this way, I can be ready to receive whatever God has prepared me for the next stage. And this is how we can show that we love God, the giver, more than the gift, that we are willing to sacrifice things. We are investing into the relationship by not being selfish. But 
with this condition, when we love the gift more than the giver, we just destroy the relationship. We keep undermining a relationship. Probably you would be able to tell about friendships or marriages that has been shattered when one only wanted to be on the receiving end of the benefits. When short-term joys were more important than long-term gains. When the gift was more valued than the giver. The same applies to our relationship with God too. Saul wanted to hold on to the gift at any cost. He knew that God wanted David to be on the throne, to be the next king. So Saul started to hunt for David. In his jealousy, Saul killed all those who had helped David. He killed even the priests who gave food to David. Saul massacred 85 priests who were clothed in their sacred robes. Saul was hurting God, hoping, hurting other people, and he was hurting himself too. His heart was not at the right place. Even this condition of the heart can be treated successfully by acknowledging God's love and, and that he's got his plans for you not to harm us, but to give us hope and a future. This condition quickly gets healed as we accept that God is good. God is God and I'm not. God is God and he knows it better. This condition gets healed when we surrender our life to God. But Saul decided to go on his own way. His heart was not at the right place. And because of Saul's heart, David was under so heavy pressure. Let's see what was going on in David's heart. The heart is the center of our emotions, desires and will. God has promised David that he will be the next king. That's an amazing promise. But as David looked around, he couldn't see any signs of it at all. The title of this psalm is of David when he had fled from Saul into the cave. David, instead of sitting on the throne, was hiding in a cold, wet cave because the king of Israel, the most powerful man in the country, moved all his army and force to find and destroy him. That was David's frightening, visible reality. A cold, wet cave around him, thousands chasing after him to kill him. So let's take a closer look into David's heart. He poured it out to God. In verses 4 to 6 we read, I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. David was fully aware of the visible reality around him. He didn't try to sugarcoat it either. I was bowed down down in distress. Probably many of us has recent experience what it means to be bowed down in distress. I love the way David is straight with God. God is big enough to deal with my emotions, so I tell him what I feel. At times, when we are going through a rough patch and something trembles us, all of our emotions are upside down. It's not a sin. There's nothing wrong with that. We are created by God with emotions and feelings. And sometimes these feelings are overwhelming. But we are not called to be led by our emotions. 
Look at David's heart. He knew that there are more than just the visibles, no matter how strong his emotions were. There's always more around us than just the danger we see. There's always more. David had a deep trust in the invisible God. He trusted in God's love for him. And this trust in God's love was stronger than his fear and emotions. Beautiful. How he prayed. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. How beautiful picture is this? In the shadow of your wings, I take refuge until the disaster has passed. If you are adventurous, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes for a few moments. You don't have to, but if you are free, please do that. And just imagine for a wee moment that you are hiding under God's wings. You are so close to him. You can even hear his heart beating. Doof, doof. Doof, doof. Doof, doof. I love you. I love you. I love you. God's heart is so beautiful. And we are going to check God's heart in a moment too. But what can we see? What's going on in David's heart? God, I believe in you. It's not easy. My emotions are carrying me away. But I trust your promises, God. I'm scared, but I run to you. I know your love for me. And I let your love in. So it would squeeze out all of my fears. This is a heart full of life. David's heart rate is at the maximum zone. It's pumping hard, but he is as healthy as a horse. What is David's reasoning? Why should God be merciful to him? For in you I take refuge. We cannot find any better reason why should God be merciful to us. There's no other way to melt God's heart than this. Be merciful to me because I come to you for safety. In you I take refuge. I trust you. And we know we can find refuge under God's wings only because Jesus has opened up the way and granted access to the Father for us. In verses 7 to 9 we read, My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul, awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. Is that, is that a natural mood of someone who is hiding in a cave because he can be killed by the army of the king any moment? It is not a natural mood. But David is not concentrating only on the frightening, visible reality anymore. He is hidden not only in the cave, but under God's wings. So he is safe, secure, trusting in God's word. I've promised we will check what's in God's heart. And I will let David to tell us what he has learned hiding under God's wings. I'm reading Psalm 105. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, 
so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according our, to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Do you see God's heart? Do you see how beautiful it is? Do you believe that God has the same heart for you. Did you know that you can go to God with anything that hurts you or bothers you because he cares for you? Did you know that actually he is the one enabling your heart to reach out for him because he loves you? And God wants to be in a personal relationship with you. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And if he chose me, he chose you before you were born. It's not because of what you do, how you feel, or what you think. God's love does not depend on you. That is God's part. God wants you. And he prepared your heart to long for his love. Our part in this relationship is to be always straight with God. Not to hide anything from him. Just as we have seen with David, God is strong enough to care strong enough to deal with our dirty laundries, with our mistakes, sins, and rebellion against God. Just as King Saul, we hurt God. Jesus volunteered to take on the punishment we would deserve for hurting God Almighty. Jesus died in our place so we can live in his place. Our part is to let God's unconditional love to wash through our heart, to clear out all fear, hurt, and sin from our life. Our part is to give Jesus full authority over our emotions, desires, and will. Remember, Jesus asked the Father to protect us from the evil one. God is always ready to do his part, so we can be ready to do our part. Amen. Let us profess our faith in Jesus together as we sing quietly our closing praise. In Christ alone, my hope is found he is my light, my strength, my song.
Let us join together in prayer. Lord Jesus, we are praising you for your love for us. Thank you that you are interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. And thank you that you have prayed for us. Not that he would take us out of this world, but that he would protect us from the evil one. Lord, we confess that each of us has known times when we have felt alone, empty and abundant. We confess that we easily become anxious about ourselves, our families, our health and our possessions. We confess that we are too easily brought low by our concerns and by our reliance on the false security of earthly things. And we did not stand on the rock that you have provided. When we are weak, Lord, please come really close to us. Put your loving arms around us and help us to keep Jesus at the center of our heart. We want to be live by the power of Christ in us. In his name we pray. Amen. It was a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thank you very much that you had me for the morning. I would love to go out and shake hands and give hugs and uh, greet you. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to do that. May God continue to bless you, keep you and protect you. The amazing grace of the Master and Lord Jesus Christ the extravagant love of God the Father and the intimate friendship of Holy Spirit be with all of us now and evermore. Amen.